So, the mind. We all have one. It gives us consciousness, gives us perspective, um, it gives us memory, and uh, the, uh, it gives us compassion, it gives us emotions. Now, it can be flawed, of course it can be flawed, you know, our memories can fail, our logical processes, and those emotions, they can take us on a real roller coaster. So we're going to talk about um, machines. I've, I've got this, this idea that we're going to move forward and, and build our minds and expand our minds into, into uh, the technological space, and that's where we're going. So um, let me first take you back to uh, where I started. I was, I was 10 years old. It was Christmas Day, and we'd gone all the way across town to, um, to my auntie and uncle's place. We did it every year. Um, all the kids had opened their presents, and there was one big box left. We tore, tore, tore off the wrapper, and this thing was inside, a Commodore VIC-20. Three and a half K of memory, a supercomputer. Well, this was computers first getting into the home, so I'd never seen one before, I'd never touched one before. We plugged it in, we played some games. And when it wasn't my turn, I opened up the, the wrapping and found inside a book, and in the book it said, you could program this thing. I didn't even know what programming was, but when it was my turn, I typed in some code and got my name flying around the screen. I was hooked. The very next day, I made my first ever game. And then, for the next few years, every weekend, I'd walk all 40 minutes across town to my auntie and uncle to spend hours hooked up on my own playing on this computer. Um, I made lots of games. Nobody ever played them. There wasn't an internet. The only people who could see it were the people who looked over my shoulder while I was doing it. But, but during this time, I got this impression that at some point in my life, I'm going to take my brain and download it into a computer. We're going to find um, a technical me sitting on a computer at some point in life. And, and this is kind of a key. I went to university where I studied computing and uh, I took a year of a psychology course, so I, I could try and understand the brain a lot, a, lot, a lot better. And what I found was humanity knows nothing, virtually nothing about the brain. A hundred million neurons, a hundred trillion uh, interconnections between those neurons, the synapses, and uh, humanity knows nothing. So I had to put the idea on a shelf. There's no way you're going to be able to download your brain onto a computer. It's just, it's just not a thing that's going to happen in my lifetime. So I, I went on with my career. Um, and as we walk through, through, through life, I, I recognized that my, um, my faculties, you know, they're, they're not quite there. You kind of assume when I was young, yeah, my, my memory is going to be brilliant. But, you know, I'd talk to somebody at a party and they'd, they'd speak to me and, and tell me their name. And within seconds, I'd forgotten it. Um, I'd see somebody in the street and wouldn't be able to pick up their name. So my, my, my memory's not there, but being the, the resourceful humans that we are, we, 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 we built tools. Um, in our pockets we have telephones, supercomputers compared to what I started on, that allow us to hook into um, knowledge bases, um, to, to, to be able to calculate. And, but also, I never have to remember a phone number again. <laughs> I don't even remember my own phone number. I've got it on the phone. So, so what we're doing is, is um, we're, we're using um, cognition that's on these machines. So it's not, it's, it's not us. Uh, it's not our brain that's working. We can share the processing power. And this is just through our interface and using our hands and using our, 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 our voices. So that's, that's our brain. But throughout my life, um, we've had uh, artificial intelligence. Before I was born, you know, I wasn't born in 1950. So artificial intelligence started off with people programming computers, or just programming the logic so that a machine felt like it had an intelligence. In the 1980s, people developed um, systems whereby you could give a computer data and it would learn how to do something itself. You wouldn't have to program it. And this was quite, quite a revelation. So, and a, a big drive forward in computers' capability of doing things you would never imagine they, they would do. But in the last seven years, um, a movement developed whereby you take machine learning and layer the machine learning techniques, and it became deep learning, hence deep, because there's layers of it. And you interconnect those, and it suddenly starts to look like a brain. And this, this opens up um, huge capabilities in, in terms of uh, what it, what's coming out of these computers. So if we look at um, what we've got in our household, we've, we've got uh, uh, Alexas, on, on, uh, chatbots on, on phones, etc. All of these have come from deep learning. We've got self-driving cars. So, so it's a, a, big, um, 
It's a big space, it's an exciting space, it's a gold rush really. I see it as a riverbed with lots of stones and there's lots of people turning them over and discovering amazing things with deep learning, but off into the distance are all these uncharted territory where stones to turn over and find out. So with this, uh, and with this in mind, I thought, well, deep learning's here now, well, let's readdress that, that idea of trying to download my brain into a computer. And I, the one thing that's going to stop me is, how am I going to plug my brain in and take all the ones and zeros and put them into the ones and zeros of the machine? Um, so I'm, I kind of contemplate, and I realize that the brain has got lots of outputs. So I've got my voice. There's an output from my brain. So I, I recorded my voice and trained a machine to have my voice. It worked very well. Then I realized that rather than taking the ones and zeros, I can use my fingers, and I typed out lots of memories, and I created a bot with all my memories in there and, and thoughts, etc. cetera. Uh, it's past natural language processing, etc. into that. So I built a, a thing that I can chat to. This was just a thing that I did at weekends just to, to hack through to see if I could. Um, so let's, uh, let me introduce you to John Howard 2.0. A little bit narcissistic, but let's go with it. Here we are. And if I turn myself on here, I can say, hello, future self. Hello from the future. So what, what can you do? Having a conversation with you. OK, so uh, what, do you, uh, what, what do you know? That would be an ecumenical matter. OK, so uh, what do you do at the BBC? I try and make the digital world a better place. What sort of digital projects do you do? I feel like I'm malfunctioning. <laughs> OK, simple. Tell me a joke. I invented a new word today, plagiarism. <laughs> Another joke? I have the heart of a lion and a lifetime ban from Chester Zoo. So, can you tell me about the future of technology? Artificial intelligence will surpass humans as the most capable life forms on the planet. Can you tell me about the future of humans? Humans will have to plug in or drop out. How will humans connect with technology? By brain interface or nanotechnology. The solution is yet to be invented. OK, thank you very much and goodbye. A goodbye to you. Have a great day. <laughs> so if we'll go back to the screen. So, so yeah, you can see that, that. It's just a hacky thing that I put together, just as a proof of concept. But um, it, it worked particularly well. Mostly. <laughs> Occasionally, reading my voice, it's having problems. But then Alexa does that as well. So, so what can we do with an interface like this? Well, maybe we could... Um, talk to our, our loved ones, you know, if, if we've lost loved ones, we could store their memories and have an interface with their, with, with their face. Or, or if we're busy, then we can, we can give an avatar of ourselves to impart information to people who might want to ask questions of it. But what I really wanted to do was to download my brain into a computer. That, that, that's kind of simulating this taking my memories. It's got, it's got an essence of me, but not, not, not really it. So what I want to do is this. What would I need to be able to download my brain? <coughs> well, first of all, I need... AI hardware that's going to be able to cope with, cope with the size of the brain. Then I'll need AI software, which will be able to process all of that data flying around at the same time. Uh, and finally, I'll need an interface that looks a little bit like a shower cap. <coughs> but it will uh, need to be able to extract 100 billion neuron states and then uh, 100 trillion pathways and interconnections between those states in an instant and transfer it into the computer. So we're a little bit of the way. Some of you may have heard of Moore's Law. This is where it uh, started in 1965. So you, uh, the number of transistors on the chip doubles every 18 months to two years. So it started off with a few hundred. We're now in, they're talking in 2017 at billions. By 2045, we're going to get to a point where a computer is produced that is a billion times more powerful than all of the human brains on the planet combined. 
So at that point, we, 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 we kind of, we're not the, the, the top dog on the planet anymore. We are going to um, have to have a choice. So are we going to cede control to our robot overlords, or are we going to join the game? So this is the idea of transhumanism. We're going to connect our brains to, to join the matrix. So already people are, are, are working in this space. Um, I met somebody recently who has uh, an antennae who can see um, colors in the, in the ultraviolet and infrared ranges. Um, and this is connected um, operationally to their, to their head. It's, it's absolutely amazing stuff. Another one who's got, um, uh, who's got connections to their ear and they can tell air pressure, so they'll call the weatherman. He's, he can tell you if it's going to rain. So, so people are using these almost as, as tattoos or, or, or earrings. Now we're getting, getting implants. So that's kind of transhumanism. But if you're, if you're connected to the matrix, is your body going to wither and die? Well, this is where biotech comes in. Biotech companies are already hacking genes. They're going to take away um, all those genes, such as ones that allow you to age. Already in this audience, there might be somebody who will live to be a 1,000, which um, is, is kind of a crazy thought. But what, what will life be like for our future selves? Is it future positive or future negative to have all these enhancements? Well, if, we're, if we've got an elevated level of, of cognition, all of a sudden we'll be able to write music and, uh, and improvise jazz <laughs> in a, a way that um, ac exceeds even how we can think about it now. We'll be able to have deep and meaningful conversations like we've never thought before. We'll be able to write stories and, and imagine uh, creations that, that, that will never have been thought of. And this is... This is in our lifetime, so the, 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 the possibilities are fantastic. So, what would you say to your future self? Well, I think uh, a good start for having a conversation with your, your, your future self is do something awesome today to make your future self feel proud. And as you probably will, may you always live in interesting times. Thank you.